Hi, my name is Barbara Krasnoff, and welcome to the New York Review of Science Fiction Readings, or NIRSIF, as we popularly know it. Um, tonight, we have a wonderful guest, Sarah Pinska, one of my favorite authors, and um, she will be reading and answering questions and answering your questions, um, so that we are hoping that you will contribute by putting your questions in the comments. Um, the engineer and producer for tonight's reading is Jim Freund. And before we begin, I will say that next month, we will have that most famous author, TBA. We will announce at some point who will be coming next month. We would, I would like to also announce um, Randy Dawn's reading at the Brooklyn Books and Booze, which will be Tuesday, June 20th at 7 p.m., and which will feature the several very uh, good authors, including J.R. Dawson, Rebecca Framau, Robert O'Toad, Molly Horan, and Linda Kleinbaum. And now, without any further ado, uh, let me introduce Sarah Pinsker. Sarah Pinsker is the Hugo and Nebula award-winning author of A Song for a New Day. We are satellites. Sooner or later, everything falls into the sea and over 60 works of short fiction. Her new collection, Lost Places, was published by Small Bear Press in, spring of, in the spring of 2023. She is also a singer-songwriter and toured nationally behind behind three albums on various independent labels. A fourth, Something to Hold, came out in 2021. She lives in Baltimore, Maryland with her wife and two weird dogs. Her words, not mine. Um, welcome, Sarah Pinsker. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for coming. Um, I will admit I am not yet finished with um, your new book, but I am about halfway through and it's a wonderful collection. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm really happy with how this one turned out. Well, tell us a little bit about, about Lost Places. Um, how, how, did, how, did it how did it come about? Uh, well, this is my second collection with, with Small Beer Press, uh, who I uh, just love working with. Um, and it's it's not a themed collection, but I think there, like any collection, there there's there's sort of themes that wind through it and and uh, notes that echo throughout. Um, and and I think I think we kind of came back a few times to to some there's there's various concepts of of lost places and various mm -hmm. concepts of 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 both lost and place. Um, there's a lot of, I, I don't know, there, there, there's some, there's some lush greenery and there's some, uh, there's some good woods. There's some stuff that has nothing to do with any of that. There, there's weird roots and mushrooms. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it kind of it kind of feels like a lot of the stories occupy some sort of physical space that that seem to echo with that that theme. But I also noticed that while several of them, at least in the beginning, are lost um, in a sort of a negative sense, in that you know it's sort of the people are lost. I just finished at least one story which in which the people actually are finding themselves in the lost place. They're they're empowering themselves. So yeah, it's not yeah, all, I think all bad. I, I think they don't need to stay lost necessarily. Um, so some are better off that way and some are not. Um, and, and sometimes it's the place that's lost and sometimes it's the people and sometimes they get found. That's um, a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, are you... Well, why don't we start with, um, you're going to read us a story? I'm going to read you a part of a story. Um, I'm just having so much fun. Read I, I just really like reading this piece. Um, and I haven't gotten to read it online yet. Uh, but this is, uh, so this is a couple of excerpts from the, the original novelette that's in here, um, which is a chunky story. It's a, it's a 
great big piece at the end um, called Science Facts with an exclamation point. Uh, Science Facts. And uh, uh, Small Beer was, was pushing a little bit for that to be the title of the book, and I was too chicken uh, because I was afraid it would get one star on Amazon for not being a book of science facts, um, like the way that people will uh, buy a book thinking it's a toaster and then they'll give it one star because they expected a toaster, even though it's perfectly good for a book or vice versa. I think that's very wise of you, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it would, would have been a really fun title. Um, but I, I don't, I think in the end, it, it, it doesn't have the resonance through as many pieces as this one does. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to read you like two, two excerpts, excerpts from it. The first is the beginning of the story, just so that we're all on the same page. And then I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, and like I said, it's a big story. So I'm only going to read you a little from the middle and there's still lots of story to go. Very good. All right. We all made it down the mountain. That's the first thing to tell because otherwise you'll jump to certain conclusions. You'll think, you know, our story. Then we went feral, turned on each other. The prurient details you add will depend on the type of media you devour, on your desire for human triumph, for nature's retribution, on your own base assumptions about what might have happened, what must have happened, if this doesn't start with telling you eight of us went into the woods and eight came out. So here's what happened. It was 5 a.m. and we were loading the van for the trip, and everyone was some combination. team counselors, Killer Whale and Godzilla, Killa and Zilla, had promised we'd snack on the road. Then Zilla loaded the last pack into the van and closed the back door and stepped back into a ho hole and snapped her ankle. We heard it go, a sound like a dry twig cracking underfoot, immediately followed by fudge. Godzilla was such a consummate camp professional, she didn't even swear in front of her campers in this situation. Commotion ensued. Killa radioed to wake the nurse and the camp director, and the nurse called an ambulance, and then Killa took six up too early 12-year-olds back over to the dining hall where we'd slept the night before, since you don't get a cabin unit when you're only at camp a single night before heading out on your trip. The kitchen staff were the only other ones awake, but they were sympathetic to our cause, and plated us scrambled eggs and toast and oatmeal from enormous pots while we waited to hear the fate of our trip and even let those of us who wanted it have some of their secret stash of good kitchen staff coffee. A couple of us moaned about how much we'd been looking forward to this trip, and the others just looked quietly disappointed. Killer Whale tried to keep everyone distracted, first with going over plans for the week, and then with a game she called Science Facts. How are science facts a game? asked Lucia. They're just facts. Here's how the game part works, Killa said. Your fact has to be connected to the previous fact in some way, like how in a card game you can match the suit or the number. You get extra points for weird things and extra points for things I don't know. How can you tell if we're telling the truth? That was Justina. Killa pulled her phone out of her pocket. Honor system. I'm allowed to look it up and verify at any point, but there are a million games where you invent answers, and this is not those games. I'll go first. Female elephants in Mozambique are evolving to have no tusks. I thought evolution was a really long-term thing. It's a response to poaching, I think. If the elephants with tusks are killed, the tuskless ones are the ones around to have babies. Good for them, said Andrea. So the next fact has to do with elephants or tusks? Katie counted off on her fingers. Or evolution, or Mozambique, or female animals, or babies, or poaching. Killa nodded in approval, and the game began. Lucia offered up the fact that baby porcupines are called porcupets. And then Justina said baby hedgehogs are called hoglets, and Nikki said hedgehogs are immune to some poisonous plants, so they chew them and then lick poison-filled saliva onto their spines, and anything that tries to eat them gets an even worse surprise than the spines alone. From there, the game devolved into a semantic argument about poisonous versus toxic, until the camp director finally made it to the dining hall to brief us. The sun had started its rise by then, though the dining hall's large west-facing windows were still night black. The camp director looked weary and stressed, which was pretty much her usual state. We were convinced the trip was doomed, since Killa wouldn't be allowed to take us on her own. Even though she'd been looking forward to it as much as we had, she'd said so. 
She'd been a trips counselor for four years now, and this particular backpacking trip was always the highlight of her summer. The director walked over to the hot drink station and dispensed a cup of carafe coffee into a travel mug, then made a face like it was left over from the night before, which it probably was, since nobody from the kitchen had come out to change it yet. She took a few sips before walking over to us. Thank you for your patience, girls. Godzilla made it to the hospital. She's waiting on x-rays, but they think it's a clean break. Katie and Andrea, who had been on last year's canoe camping trip with Zilla, made relieved sounds. And I have good news for you, she continued. We found someone else to go in her place, so your trip can still happen. Killa tried to catch her eye, clearly surprised. She looked away. There's no dedicated drama program this week, so Diva was scheduled as a third counselor on junior arts and crafts. She said she'd be willing to go. Crap, Killa said. We looked at her and she tried to save herself. I mean, crepuscular. That means related to twilight, but I like twilight, so I use it to mean great. Crepuscular, said Justina with enthusiasm. The camp director sipped her coffee, winced, and continued. Godzilla said Diva could use her gear, so she's down at the van right now repacking Zilla's pack with her own clothes. You should be able to leave soon. Crepuscular, Katie and Andrea said. Andrea might have said crepuscular, which was closer to Killa's opinion. She turned to us. Why don't you all use the bathroom one more time before we hit the road? You have my special permission to use the indoor instead of the outhouse. The indoor was usually reserved for counselors. We headed toward the foyer, and Killa turned to her boss. She wasn't quiet. You couldn't find anyone else? She shook her head. I'm sorry, I know you two don't get along. Has she ever camped a night in her life? She chose the nickname Diva. She runs the drama tent. Killa could go on. Diva had only applied to work there because she was between apartments. She didn't like kids. She was a clean freak who avoided touching the costumes in her own drama tent. She disappeared at the end of every week when it was time to clean. Saying any of that also served as an indictment of the director for hiring her, though, so Killa stopped. Okay, so you want me to cancel the trip? Do you want to tell these girls? It's diva or nothing. No trip. Disappointment city. And who knows if their parents are around to take them back or went away themselves. Not to mention we can't afford refunds on an entire program. This is the minimum damage option. Please say you can deal. A week with the counselor she hated most. A week managing someone who probably needed more maintenance than any of the campers. Or no trip, and knowing she was the one who had disappointed us. She sighed. I can deal. So I'm going to pause there and jump a few pages. They uh, they head out on the trip. Uh, Diva is instantly very annoying. She doesn't know anything about, about camping, and uh, they make it through the first day of hiking to their um, to their campsite. And that is where we'll pick up again. After dinner, we sang songs around the fire. We could have cooked over our little gas burner, and it was warm enough that the fire was superfluous. But Killa liked to sing around a fire the first night as a bonding thing. Don't think about how many nights you're away from your family, or the darkness, or anything it contains. We were at the age where everyone at school was telling us what was cool and who was cool, And some of us were maybe starting to believe it. But right now, for a few more nights or a few more minutes, we sang earnestly. Even Megan sang along, though she shook her head when it was her turn to pick a song. This was what Killer Whale loved most about leading these trips. This and the views. This and the chance to teach kids it was possible to step away from their devices for a minute. To teach us to look up and look around. To be somewhere and just be. All of which was why she was so pissed off when she looked over to see the diva had her phone by her thigh, typing with one thumb, her neck craned at an unsubtle angle. Hey, diva, she said, do you want to lead a song? The other counselor startled and slipped her phone back into her jacket pocket. The illuminated screen shone through. I, I don't really sing, but I can tell a story. Do you girls want a story? Is it scary? asked Katie. Diva grinned. You can tell me after you hear it. 
Killa opened her mouth to say no scary stories on the first night, but there wasn't a good way to say it in front of the girls. It was another thing her usual trips partner, Godzilla, knew implicitly. Anyway, we had all reoriented ourselves towards Diva, with looks ranging from excitement to trepidation on our faces. Once upon a time, Diva started, and Killer Whale remembered that Diva was the drama counselor for a reason. She'd shifted into a narrator's voice. What was her background again? A local theater troupe, and she'd been to Vancouver to act in a couple of TV series, bit parts, but even Killer Whale had to admit she wasn't bad. Once upon a time, a beautiful young actor got invited to spend the summer working with kids at a scouting camp. She was excited about it, a chance to live in a cabin in the woods, rustic but not without basic amenities, a chance to impart a love of acting to the campers. She took the time to research activities for kids and she cataloged and disinfected every item in the costume tent because she wanted to do a good job. She had three mostly good weeks doing all the things she was supposed to, and then something unusual happened. Another counselor injured herself, someone whose job was to take advanced campers backpacking, and the actor was told she was needed on the trip. She asked if there were any other options. She wasn't really much for camping, though she'd done it a few times as a kid. But her boss called this other duties as assigned and made it clear it was non-negotiable. So she went. She hiked and she camped and she ate bad tacos over a fire. She did her best, even though the campers all knew more about backpacking than she did. She made up for it by telling them stories. Are you just telling us what's happening right now? Interrupted Lucia. This isn't a story. Shh, said Diva. This is where it changes. At the end of the trip, the group made their way back toward the parking lot where they'd left the van. They emerged from the woods at the spot where they'd gone in, but for a second they thought they must have taken a wrong turn. The parking lot had become overgrown in the week they'd been gone, the gravel erupting with young conifers and deer ferns and bushes heavy with ripe salmon berries and red and orange and gold. Maybe we took a wrong turn, said the actor. This is definitely the, uh, the right place, said the other counselor who thought she was always right. I'm never wrong. Somebody is wrong, said the most loudmouthed camper. Hey, said Lucia, is that supposed to be me? Shh, said Diva, names have been changed to protect the innocent. Where was I? A young forest had grown up where the parking lot should have been. The ranger station had a hole in the roof with a cedar tree growing through it, and it looked like one of those old barns by the side of the highway that nobody has kept up, so it kind of falls in on itself. Was the van still there? Katie's voice was only a whisper. It was. The insufferable counselor was correct that they were in the right place, but the van was barely recognizable and surrounded by baby trees. Its tires had rotted away, so it was standing on four rusted rims. It had moss growing on top of it and broken windows, and mice had made nets, nests in the seat upholstery. How did they know it was their van? At first they didn't, but when they opened the back door, there was a blue plastic cooler right where they had left their lunch cooler the week before. Plastic takes ages to decay. Also, the keys fit, said Andrea. They opened the trunk, so the keys must have fit. Good point, said Diva. What do you think they did next? Check their phones? If they turned off their phones like they were supposed to, or had extra batteries or solar power, maybe they still had battery. Oh yes, they tried that. Nobody answered, and they didn't have any signal at all. They should go into the ranger station. Yes, that's what they did next. The actor went in, because she didn't want the campers to get injured if the rest of the roof fell in. And do you know what she found? No, nobody did. Megan looked ready to cry. The building didn't even have a door anymore. The actor walked in. On the wall inside, she found a rain-ruined poster that read, Have you seen these people? But it had torn, so she couldn't see who was on it. There was a rain-rotted wooden desk, and on it was a National Parks calendar, but it said July 2044, which made no sense to her. It must have been a joke calendar. Except when she went outside, she found one of those bulletin boards that stand at the start of trails, and on it was another Have You Seen These People poster. But this one was laminated, and the picture on the poster was a picture of her and her campers. 
We didn't take a picture. It's not us. We didn't take a picture. Maybe it was photoshopped or our parents gave our pictures. This isn't about us, obviously, but it is. You heard her. Our van, 20 years past. No, it didn't, said Katie morosely. More than 20 years past. 2044 was what was on the calendar, but that calendar was obviously from the last month when the station was still in use and had a roof and everything. Then there was more time after it wasn't kept up anymore. That was when they let the roof rot and fall in. We've been missing way longer. Not we, Killer Whale said sharply. This wasn't a story about us, remember? Tell them, Diva. No, of course not. It's just a story. I want to call my mom. Better not to. What if she doesn't answer because time passes differently here and it's already been a hundred years? Lucia said this in a helpful tone. Half the girls looked ready to cry. Killer Whale glared at Diva, who looked delighted. Show them, Killa said. Show them what? Take out your phone and show them the date. What phone? asked Diva. Killer Whale summoned her most lethal glare. Diva did as she was told, then responded to an incoming message before putting away the phone. See, it still sends. You can ask me to send you my phone anytime. And I bet Killa has a solar battery she'll let me use to make sure my phone doesn't run out, out of charge, so we can keep checking it all week. She looked pleased with her generosity. Killa looked murderous. Satisfied? It was just a scary story. It wasn't much of a story, said Nikki. Everyone looked over. Was it the first time Nikki had spoken voluntarily? It might have been. That isn't an ending, it's a plot twist. That's where the story begins. A good story would go on from there to tell us what they all did next. Okay, fine, said Diva. What do they do next? Nikki folded her arms across her chest. It's your story, not mine. You figure it out. It's not even like one of those urban legends where the helpful stranger has some identifying feature exactly like the murderer, or the woman places the final puzzle piece and realizes it's her house with somebody staring in through the window. You know in those stories what happens next is the murderer murders her. If that wasn't going to happen, you'd have to tell the rest of the story, since that's the obvious conclusion your imagination fills in. As it is, you just said all that to scare us, which is not a nice thing to do to a bunch of kids you're supposed to be looking out for. Everyone looked at Nikki like she had grown a second head. What? I read, in case you hadn't noticed. And we're all glad you do, said Killer Whale. That's a really good point. Now that we've listened to Diva's disturbing and entirely fictional story, how about one more song and then we head to bed? We have a long day tomorrow. Nikki, you can choose the song. Nikki chose the song the counselors usually sang to serenade the campers at the end of a campfire and looked at Killer Whale and Diva expectantly. Killer Whale, in turn, looked at Diva to make sure she understood she was expected to join in. She did. Killer Whale waited until we had all brushed our teeth and settled into our tents before climbing into the tent she and Diva were sharing. Diva lay in her sleeping bag with her eyes closed, like Killa hadn't seen a screen lighting up the tent one second before she unzipped it. Not worth fighting the same battle again. She chose a different one. What happens at the end of your story? Diva shrugged. I hadn't figured it out yet. It's something I think about every time somebody makes me go camping. Ever since I was a kid. Time flows differently to a forest, so why wouldn't time flow, flow differently in a forest? Why tell these poor kids a story like that? Are you kidding? They loved it. If anyone gets scared tonight, you're the one comforting them. Except, of course, she wasn't. When Killer Whale heard crying in the middle of the night, she reached over to shake Diva, but Diva didn't stir. And really, who would want to be comforted by her? None of these girls. Killa sighed and went to help Katie, who was, not surprisingly, having a nightmare about the story Diva had told. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. And that was Sarah Pinsk. Pisker, and she was reading from her brand new collection called Lost Places. And that does indeed sound like it was possibly a lost place. It is a lost place, though. Uh, the, I'll say that the thing that's happening is not the thing that happens in that story. There, there are several campfire stories uh, that take place in that in, um, in, over the course of that novelette. And, and um, that is, so it isn't a story of of the kids step out and it's a hundred years in the future. Um, 
Although I'll tell you, if I were a kid and someone told me that story, I'd be heading home the next morning just right, to make right. sure. Yeah, and and in the next scene, the girl who's having a nightmare says, you know, she won't even like she's afraid to even make the phone call, and and she imagines her that like she would go home and her brother would answer, but she would slowly realize it isn't her brother it's her brother's kid at the same age her brother was when she left and so she doesn't even want to make the call because making the call could make it worse yes of course and these are kids who grew up on science fiction and that kind of thing so so they would know all the various implications of a story yeah like that. yeah one of them is a one of them uh, a, a thing that I should say that I was a Girl Scout camp uh, counselor for a few years, and and that's part of part of what's in the DNA of this story. Um, but what I've noticed is in the last few years, in an effort to sort of hip up the the programming, a lot of them will uh, do stuff like instead of instead of orienteering, they'll call it you know. Uh, escape from zombies and instead of archery they'll call it hunger games and yeah and that sort of thing so so uh they're yeah but they're they're all into that sort of thing however you call it to very varying degrees um yeah now now this is i think you said this was like a novelette side story You've written your prose in a lot of different lengths. You've short stories. You've got at least one novel. Do you have more? Two and, novels. Two novels, sorry. Two novels. Okay. And when you begin a work, do you know how long it's going to be? Generally, yes. I, I feel like uh, it's a it's a it's a skill that I've that I think I've I've honed over over several years, but but I can usually recognize the the sort of story that an idea wants to be mm -hmm. like there, there are ideas there are ideas that are clearly novel length ideas and there are ideas that are more suited to to get in get out um and sometimes you can twist a couple of those together together and and extend the thing uh and sometimes something that i thought was a short story will nag at me and I'll, I'll find my way back into that world and find other stories to tell in that world. Um, but, or, you know, other characters and um, inhabiting spaces that, that also deal with the same thing. But for the most part, I usually know the length that, that an idea wants to be. Yeah, you mentioned short stories like being in a different world or in the same world. Do you do much world building? I uh I I love I love world building and I don't tend to do there, there's some world building exercises that I adore that I adore using for students um have I used them as much for myself yes and no like I I think everything can benefit from ask the next question the the sort of the Ted Sturgeon mm -hmm. um you know poking at the edges of the things that the thing that you've written and the thing that you're trying to explore. Um, and I think that's essentially what a lot of world building is. And so do I write myself a, like a, a series Bible type of deal? No. It, and, and for most of the ideas that I have, that would be overkill. Yeah. Um, but do I try to explore as much of, of, do I? Yeah, yeah. I tr I try to at least look around a little bit and make sure I'm telling the the story that wants that needs to be told in that particular setting. And how about the process? I mean, is your process for writing a short story different from that of writing a novelette? Different from that of writing a novel, which of course is far longer and more complex. Uh, I can't say that my process is is super different. Um, my second novel, I had. Uh, was under contract and I had to um, to submit a uh, an outline mm -hmm. and that was the only time I've ever worked off of an outline um, and I actually enjoyed it more than I thought I would I was I was sort of pushing against it and and 
complaining that it would, you know, ruin the spontaneity and I I want to discover things. Um, and it turned out that it, it doesn't actually ruin the the spontaneity and, and there's plenty of room for discovery writing even within. And there are plenty of times that I left, I, 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 the, the finished novel did not look like the outline after the, maybe the three quarter mark. I, I, I maybe even the halfway mark. I, 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 but it was useful for aiming, f figuring out what I was, what, what the shape of the thing was. Um, for the most part, I'm a discovery writer. Um, I'll, I'll work in a notebook sometimes uh, to sort of ask myself questions, um, but, and so, and interrogate things a little bit, but mostly I just start writing and then if it isn't going well, I'll pick a different character or a different perspective and, and just start again and start again and start again, or pick up where I was and, and see what happens next if I, if I switch characters. And eventually I'll find the one that, that I like. Well, before we go any further, I do want to say that um, for those of you who are watching this live, and um, this will be available on um, YouTube um, afterwards if you'd like to watch it, um, the, we uh, welcome your questions and just um, put your questions in the comments or chat area and Jim, who is engineering, will pick them up and let me know that you've got a question and I will ask Sarah. Um, to, to, to move a little bit aside, I asked you the difference between writing a short story and a novel. Now you've been published by both independent presses such as Small Beer Press, but also as by a major house such as Berkeley. Um, how is how is the experience different? Uh, the, yeah, they were both. I, I had good experiences with both. Uh, they they are a little different. Um, and I, you know, I, I I can't even. Obviously, like you know, Berkeley Berkeley is part of Penguin Random House, and and meant that you know there was a a big staff that that could. With a team to help out with things where where small beer is a, a much smaller outfit. Um, uh, you know, I, I felt like I had my say in in both circumstances. I I made arguments for for titles that I liked, and I made arguments for things that should be in the books, and and I won and covers, and I won some battles, and I lost some and um for the most part i think for the most part i think that they were right about the things that i that i was you know that i lost on um i've i've come around to their thinking on on some of those things um there was a story that that uh i wrote for the first collection for small beer uh mm -hmm. that they that they said didn't belong in in the book um and i said but i wrote it for this book how could it not belong i feel like it it belongs here and they said no no it doesn't belong here and um and i you know went away and i sold it somewhere else and and then when we put this book out i put it on the on the my suggested table of contents and and they took it and uh and I was thinking about it and, and, you know, why, why the one book and why not the other. And, and I, th I think they were right. It, it wasn't the right story to be the original in sooner or later. Um, it, it was, it wasn't substantial enough for that. Um, but it's a story I absolutely love. And I think it, it's, it fits very, very well here. So, so um, yeah, I'm happy to have, I'll say it now that I'm happy to have uh, lost that argument at the time, um, even though even though I walked around with a chip on my shoulder about that. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, now we've talked about you as a writer, but you're also a musician. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so, so I uh, I usually say I'm a singer songwriter, and then I have a rock band that plays the same songs louder and faster. And uh, I have four albums out, three solo and one with my band. Um, and I do feel that there's sort of a teeter-totter uh, of, of which thing I'm paying attention to. And if I'm, 
I, I, I don't seem to be very good at writing music when I'm writing fiction. Um, just just the, the, the kind of ideas that I get seem to be story ideas when I'm thinking story and I have to sort of force myself back into the other space these days. Uh, I still love to play music. I'm just, the, the songs are more sporadic. Um, I think part of that is I, I've trained myself pretty well at this point to, to be able to write on command. Um, if, if anyone ever needs me to, to sit in their window, like, like Harlan Ellison and bash out the first draft of a story. Like I, I think I can do that. And I, I go out on my dog walks and I come back ready to, ready to write every day. Um, and for me, songwriting has always felt like a thing where the muse has to hit in a different way. Mm -hmm. like I think I can write my way into a story. A story is a draft. I can, I know how to make it better. All of that. Um, but a song a song feels more delicate and a song feels like something that has to to sort of come to me in the space where I'm ready to receive it and and I haven't been giving myself the time and space to do that as part of the problem but I still love to play I'm happy right. anytime I get a chance to play yeah. well we have a question from from the from the audience from Jeremy Brett hey Jeremy who asks, Sarah, are you weary yet of hearing how prescient Song for a New Day was? It's tough to be a prophet, right? Oh, boy. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, I, the, the number of things in that book that, that seem to have come true is terrifying if I think about it too much. And, and you'll notice I haven't, uh, since, since we are satellites, uh, I haven't written a whole lot of uh, near future fiction. <laughs> um, but I, you know, it comes from, it comes from the ask the next question thing. Like, I think, I think I came up with a premise for Song for a New Day and I interrogated it within an inch of its life. And, and I, think I don't know that I necessarily would have hit the right questions, but I asked the right questions to to come close to something that we had no idea was was coming our way. But um but it's been I mean some of them are interesting. The there have been online music festivals and they do have like places where you can buy swag for your avatar and like reclothe your avatar and um uh, that sort of thing and the announcement from from Apple this week about about the their uh, version of of hood space. I think I, I still think I still think the hoodie is a like would look cooler than than everyone walking around in their glasses. But but uh, oh, don't yeah. talk to I, me I think, about Apple. Um, yeah, I mean the pandemic. You <laughs> ask the right if you ask the right people and you ask the right questions, people, there were people preparing for this kind of thing. The harder thing, I, I mean, the frustrating thing is both in the book and briefly in real life, there were moments where we said, you know, like there is good that can come from this if we allow it. And some of it was things that we, um, it, uh, stuff like hybrid conventions, right? Yeah. Like, like the fact that, you know, we've acknowledged that people, that, that not everyone can make it in physical space and we've made room for people who can't. Um, well, and you know, it was, it was because of a, a horrible pandemic, but, but, um, there are plenty of people who couldn't make it to things before that, either because spaces were inaccessible or because of, uh, immune system disorders or, uh, children and childcare or, um, you know, a, a whole host of things or fi finances and we've opened up a lot of spaces. And then the question is, what are we going to do? Are we going to, you know, continue having hybrid, even though that that may sometimes be more work? Um, or are we going to just go back to saying, la, 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 the, the pandemic is over and, you know, everyone back to as things were. Um, and, and I there, there have been so many opportunities like that, that we've, 
we've said, hey, look at this thing we can do. And then and then sort of just said, never mind, we're not going to do that after all. Um, I think that's an education, too. You know, that's a fascinating point. And, you know, just just to take this a little further, because um, at work, I'm with a group of people um, with, dis you know, we have various interest groups and one is people with disabilities. And that's a frequent topic of conversation. Um, you know, we've gotten used to be able to to do Zoom and other online things. And um, a lot of people, you can now are, have readings from people from Baltimore in New York. Um, we can, or people from China for that matter. Um, are we going to go back to, to having the kind of thing where you actually have to go there um, and conventions where you actually have to be there and even if, if you can't afford it or um, need, need, need special help to get there. Um, I'm, really, I'm really going to be interested to see how that turns out over the next 10 years. Right. And it doesn't have to be a passive thing either. I mean, we can, we can work towards making those spaces um, and, and keeping, keeping those doors open. Absolutely. Um, until we get another question from the audience, and we, we still welcome your questions, I'm going to go back a little bit to the to our talking about music in that I was curious about whether, whether as a musician, whether that affects your prose writing or vice versa in I, some fashion. Yeah, I absolutely think it does. I... Uh... I've taught some classes for for uh, Cat Rambo um, about the idea that that there's something transferable in, between those two skills um, and, and between those two crafts is really what it is because they're in both cases it's it's stuff that that you can you can learn and you can practice and you can improve and I I, I think. There are a couple of things that I got from music. Uh, one of them is I, I was fortunate to make all of my mistakes. <laughs> I shouldn't say all of my mistakes. I'm sure there's plenty of room to still make mistakes. I made a lot of uh, mis uh, early career mistakes in my in music um, that I then didn't have to make in fiction, and I, oh, I got to be an I got to be an arrogant kid in you know, 21, 22, 23 in music instead of being an arrogant writer walk, you know, so, so, so I feel like I, I sort of stepped into these spaces more, more fully formed than, than I did uh, professional music spaces. And I, I think that has been, been a nice thing for me. Um, and it, with regards to actual, uh, transferable skills. I think. I think that uh, there there are rhythms in prose. I'm not. I'm not a poet, uh, but I, I think that there there are things that I learned from having to distill a story to three verses and a chorus and maybe a bridge. You know, um, and and finding the way to convey everything you needed to convey in that amount of space. Um, when I went back to prose, which I, I had written prose in, you know, as a kid in high school and in college, and then I started writing songs and I put aside the, the fiction for a while. But I think when I came back to it, it felt like, uh, just this, you know, the, the, the color palette was, was, you know, every, every color between every color in the rainbow, uh, just, just because I had so much, you know, and it, an unlimited amount of space to tell those stories that I had been telling in such a, a limited space. Um, and some of it has to do with just like rhythms of lines and feeling like spending time on beginnings and endings uh, mm -hmm. and making sure that the, you, the, there, I feel like there are rhythms that I use that, that can kind of pound lines into someone's head. Um, the way that, that you leave a song and you're still humming it. Um, and, and I try to, to sort of deploy some of those things uh, as, as I head out of a piece. Um. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, how about 
what would you think of someone adapting your work for audio or streaming series or cinema? So, so there's an interesting thing with um, a song for a new day and and Our Lady of the Open Road, which was the story that that preceded it, um, where I. <laughs> I know the songs that are in those books. Like I, I know what those, those, you know, that they sound like to me. And I also know that in telling you exactly what they sound like, I would limit it. Um, this, I, I got fan mail for, for both the story and the book where people would tell me what the band sounded like to them. And it was everywhere on the spectrum they you know people would tell me like folk bands and people would tell me rock bands and punk bands and and what it said to me is that like if i wrote the character right then people because because i approached writing about music um when i wrote about the band i wrote about either the experience of listening to them what it was like to be in the audience and how it moved someone um or what it felt like to play it. But I don't, I feel like describing the actual music is, is a, a, like an album reviewer's job. And that isn't the job of a, a fiction writer necessarily. And mm -hmm. if you do that, you're sort of hemming it in. And if people don't like the, the music you're describing, they're going to tune it out. They're going to say, hey, you know, I don't believe that a band that sounds like this would actually, you know, have a hit in this day and age type of deal. So, so, so I think that there's this like opening of possibilities by, by letting people imagine it, which means that uh, if it were to be adapted, it would, you know, out of necessity be locked in. And I right. would do that. Um, this, and, and, you know, that's, that's sort of a shame to me, but I don't know that I would. I, I, I'm still, I, I like the, I, I've always looked at adaptations as uh, cover versions. But it would yeah, be, yeah. Because it would be a cover version that, it, it would be the, like the, the Jimi Hendrix all along the Watchtower. You know, it would be the cover version that people use to index all other versions, even superseding the original. Mm. Mm. Um, which isn't, you know, for good and for bad. Um. Okay. Well, we've got several questions from the audience. The first one is from Addie Peshkis, and it's and um, she says, "Hello, Sarah." She has a question about generative AI and writing. It's being used now to write whole books. Are there areas you think it could be a good thing, and are there areas you think people aren't paying enough attention to where it could be really harmful? For example, a confluence of extreme political media and Gen AI, where you have competing AI trying to move the Overton window. Uh, I think there's a lot in there too. There, there's a lot in there um, too. I, I mean, I, I am currently very skeptical. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, to join uh, Ted Chang in, in uh, calling it applied statistics. Um, and, and I think I, I I'm, yeah, I, I, I'm not interested in this thing called generative AI for fiction. Like, I, I think that, you know, it, it can still be, it can be a useful thing in, in, you know, generating generic, uh, paragraphs about, about something where there is still a human overlook. Like, like that, that are not fiction that are, you know, like, like product. Uh, yeah. Uh, what do you call it? Like, I, I don't, sorry, I'm not a, a, a business person. I don't, I forget the, the terms for that. Like, like just like the product text, like that kind of thing where a human still looks, looks it over and makes sure that it's, uh, you know, looks like it's written by a human and doesn't promise anything that that product doesn't, uh, shouldn't be promising. Um, in terms of generative fiction, um, I, I look at those things. And again, Ted called it applied statistics and it's predicting what, what you want to see next. And it's doing that by, uh, by plagiarizing, by having read, you know, read 
it doesn't understand the things it's read. It's not an intelligence. It, it, it looks at the things it's read and, and it makes a guess at what words you want next based on the, the huge number of texts that, that's been input into it. And uh, I'm personally not interested in, in reading what a machine thinks should be the next words on a page. Um, and I'm therefore also not interested in using that as a, as a tool for, for fiction. And I would like to think none of my students will be coming in with that anytime soon um, either. Uh, I'm trying to get into the uh, confluence of extreme political media. Um, yeah, I mean, I do think that there is a risk of, you know, we already have bots, you know, just trying by sheer force of numbers to imply that there are more people in, uh, on one side of an issue than there are. Um, when, when they poll actual people, you know, you find out that, that a very small number of people is pushing an agenda like book banning. Um, what did they, I think they looked up the, and it was like 11 people who were doing all of the, yeah. um, the majority of the complaints and getting books removed. And, um, I, so I feel like like there's absolutely a possibility for for using using this kind of uh, <laughs> this kind of engine to do to do that in great in great numbers and and the same for political issues of all sorts um, and I am terrified of that um, as terrified as I am I, the the fiction thing I, I would like to think is a non starter and if we treat it as one then it can be but. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't think your your fears are unfounded. Yeah, I I totally agree with you, and um, I just want to mention I may have misgendered Addy, and if so, I apologize. Yeah, I know him. Um, yeah, but, uh, um, sorry. Um, okay, uh, Barbara Bengals writes. When did you start reading SF, and whose work did you uh, did you or do you enjoy most? Of how did or do your parents respond to your being an SF writer? Uh, well, uh, I started reading it when I started reading. I think um, I, in in so far as probably I started reading with. I, I remember, you know, Madeline Langle and uh, very early on, and. Um, Walter Farley, which honestly, I, like a lot of his stuff is actually more fantastic. Like you think about the Black Stallion, but also uh, there were the the Island Stallion books where where someone found this uh, island that had like rock ringing a hidden valley um, full of horses, uh, and and there were ghosts and there were treasures and 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 all sorts of things. So so all of those books. Uh, and and then and uh, Earthsea and, and uh, uh, the Triffid or the um, not the Triffids the uh, the tripods and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and my my father has a huge science fiction collection um, so so I also discovered FNSF fairly early um, and uh, I've been making my way through his collection ever since some of it has, has wound up on the shelves behind me and uh, he's still got some of it. Um, but, but yeah, I was, I was lucky to grow up with it. His, his collection has a lot of short fiction too, which I think is unusual, but he has, um, well, I did steal all of the anthologies like that, uh, that la these are all, all, all um, years best. They're double, there's, there's books behind books and um it's all the year's bests and all of the Asimov presents and, and um, um, Gardner's uh, year's bests. And then uh, Ellen Datlow and Terry Windling's fantasy and horror year's bests. And um, all of, I can probably do it here, all of Le, somewhere up here is Le, all of Le Guin's uh, collections <laughs> and novels. And way up at the very top is all the paperbacks. Um, so, so um yeah, every 
I got to read everything, which also then, how did my parents respond to my being an SF writer? They are very happy. Uh, they are very, very supportive parents. And um, uh, I, I think, I think probably for a while they did try to to get it into my head that probably it wasn't the best career choice, which is how I ended up being a singer songwriter because no one got around to saying that to me. Um, so, so uh, the highly lucrative. Uh, field of, of folk singer songwriter opened up to me for, for, for several years. Um, and when I was done with that, I was, I was ready to, to be a little less hungry, but, um, I was, I've been lucky that, that, uh, that I've had a good experience in fiction. This has been a wonderful 10 years that I've been here and, uh, yeah, I, I think, I think they're happy at this point and they were probably happy to begin with, but. Another user would like to know um, if there's any nonfiction you'd ever like to write. Oh, um, that's a fun question. Um, nonfiction that I'd ever like to write. Okay, so I do not know that I'm the expert. I, I was a history major and I get very, very uh, caught up in, in my research. Um, if back to the world building question from earlier, I I will admit that like for my current novel, I have twenty thousand words of prose so far and sixty thousand words of notes. Um, so so if if you told me I needed to write a book on uh, midtown hotels of the nineteen twenties, I could do it at this point um, very happily and. Um, uh, but but also I, I would love to at some point maybe write, I know there's a million craft books out there, but I collect them and I love them and I wouldn't mind uh, maybe compiling my thoughts on on music, how, how music can inform fiction and, and getting those out there in a, in a nonfiction book. That, I've, no one's ever asked me that before. That's a fun question. That's, and and that's, that would be fascinating. I'd, I'd love to read some essays by you uh, exactly on, on that topic. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've been thinking about maybe doing that. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of... Of of what else uh, we we haven't covered? Um, ah, uh, Zig Zigzag Claiborne wants to know what excites you most about the current state of sci-fi and fantasy. Uh, I mean, what doesn't excite me about the current state state of science fiction and fantasy? There there are so many great voices out there right now. There are great venues where people are getting. Uh, published and and the doors have opened wider in terms of who whose voices we get to hear and i think every one of those things is is um is, is just a wonderful thing i want to hear more queer voices i want to hear more voices of writers of color and i i want to read stories that i have not experienced um and and i am so grateful that that publishing has even a little bit uh with with a, a long way to go um moved in a direction of of making sure that some of those voices get heard um just yeah if I, i'm i'm super excited i'm a i'm a juror for the sturgeon award and and like i just look at the the finalists this year and i'm super happy and and most of the most of the award finalists these days I look at those lists and I say you know this is this is a good thing absolutely uh, Barbara Bengals asks are there any specific SF or fantasy writers whom you've met and who blew you away be because you'd always idolize them and on the other hand were you shocked when they were impressed in meeting you <laughs> um well, I, I have to say one one thing that made my day several years ago. I had a, a story called, and then there were N minus one, which is about a convention of um, Sarah, Sarah Pinskers at a uh, who have figured out how to how to um, 
you know, meet each other across the multiverse and they, they decide to have a convention and compare notes. Um, and, and I went to the nebulous that year and I met Connie Willis for the first time. And she looked at me and she said, so which Sarah Pinsker are you? And uh, that was about the, the coolest thing ever. Um, uh, writers that I've met and, and uh, always idolized. I, I blew my chance at, at uh, having at, at meeting Le Guin. Um, I, I was only 14 and I, I held my hand up at a reading and I asked a question and um, I, I I phrased it. We had we had a funny interaction, but and I ever since then I, I had always wanted to uh, try to have a do over, but it, it never actually happened. Um, and everyone else has just been wonderful. A, a lot of the the people who like I was lucky that the people who I idolized, the people who I admired, I should say, turn out to be wonderful people. I. I um, I know there are some bad actors in our field and they happen to not be the people who I was reading. So, so um, I grew up, re uh, I was a huge fan of, of Karen Joy Fowler and I love everything she writes and turns out she's super nice. And um, uh, who else was I reading as a kid who I, who I got to meet? Uh, yeah. Connie, Molly Gloss, uh ted every yeah everyone's really nice maureen McHugh. i, I just i'm 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 lucky how how about people who you haven't met i because this was something i was going to ask what other writers have had either you know have you been affected by or that you just like oh i mean i never and I, I wasn't in the field uh when uh, Octavia Butler died before I entered the field, I, I, I would have been old and not like if I had if I had been kept writing instead of going into music, there might have been a chance. If I had gone to Clarion, if I had you know, or Clarion West, if I had, um, but I also think that if I had done that, I, I might have. I don't think I would have been uh, the same career. I I I. I developed a voice by going through what I, the music stuff that got me into this. So I, it, it's a hard thing to say, well, what if on, on that? Um, I would have loved to, like I said, to have a, a an actual conversation with Le Guin. She, she is my favorite favorite, um, but, but, but we only had that one, uh, one conversation across the Gulf and then she signed my book for me. And, uh, I don't know. The names are names are leaping yeah. from my head right now. But, oh, but, most, right. I, I, but I, I also just feel like everyone, everyone who I admire turned out to be really nice. Um, I, I've been fortunate to like play music with Charles Delint. He's a great guy, and I, you know to work with Kelly Link and to um, oh, just everyone's nice. Everyone's like, yeah. Um, now here's something I, I often, and there's still a little time left people. So if you have any questions, please let, let us know. But one thing I always ask, which is, is, do you have any, is there anything we haven't covered that, um, you'd like to mention or talk about? Uh, no, I can, not nothing off the top of my head. Um, I can tell you about the cover of this book, which I think oh, is, sure. is, is actually an entertaining thing. Uh, Small Beer picked it, but I, I, I think it's a it, telling the telling what it is actually is is fun because I didn't know until until I asked. But it is a um, an 18th century uh, plate from a, a book. Uh, there, there was a man who went up in a hot air balloon, and came back down and wrote a 400 page book describing what he had seen. Um, and 
he commissioned three plates for the book at great expense. And this is one of them. I believe one shows the view, including the balloon. One shows the view without the balloon. Um, but obviously the person who was drawing it was not the person who told the story. Um, and, and so I, I love the fact that, that, so what you're seeing there is like the view from a hot air balloon of fields in England, I believe. And, and the funny thing is, is that I, that, like concentric nature of it, like mm -hmm. like the I think they're meant to be trees. They kind of look mushroomy to me, but it looks like <laughs> trees and hedges. But but the idea, like you know, it, it's like it's like all the the weird taxidermy done by people who haven't seen the animal that they have to taxidermy. Um, there there's just this like sort of alien sense of it uh, because it's it's an aerial view from someone who's never seen an aerial view and and. And so it's not a it's not a lost place, but it's a you know a place that didn't exist because it's it's taken from something described at great length, but but still it isn't a perfect translation. Okay, great. Okay, now now in the coming months you're going to be at ReaderCon. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is outside of Boston, and that's coming up in July. And you are also going to be reading at the Brooklyn Books and Booze and also coming up in July. Um, and that's with Jeff Ford, who's one of my favorite writers. I love Jeff Ford's writing. And I love his reading, too, actually. I love him reading his work. Um, and you and later on this year, you will be at Capclave, which is Washington, D.C. Yeah, yeah. I'll be the uh, co-guest of honor at Capclave with Charlie Jane Anders. And I'm very excited about that, too. I think we're going to. We're gonna have a good time. Okay, well, thank you, thank you so much, Sarah. This was just wonderful. Um, again, um, we've been talking to Sarah Pinsker, whose latest book is a collection called Lost Places, and which you need to go out and buy now because it's a wonderful collection, uh, which I can say from personal experience. Um, our, uh, my name is Barbara Krasnoff. Our engineer and, and producer is Jim Freund. And next week, next month, we will be here um, with a mystery guest who we will publicize as soon as we know who that mystery guest is. Um, if you like our um, Nearsif readings, we would welcome, the, they cost money. Um, it costs money for the software and for various other things. So you can make donations at paypal.com slash paypalme dash our wolf. And thank you so much, Sarah. This was just absolutely wonderful. Lovely to talk with you. Okay. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful and healthy month, and we will see you soon. Take care. <laughs>